forgive me. Mark is nice as he's been to me, and I don't even remember his title. Isn't that all? <laughs> he's been the sweetest thing that you ever saw. <laughs> he's another one I've adopted. You're going to lose a lot of these Texans to Oklahoma. <laughs> tell you what the hell fires are, God told me. The hell fires are lighted in the hearts of men. The hell fires are this, lust, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, dope.
I'm going to speak with you on a subject. And don't mind the thing that drops up here. <laughs> My Bible's full of everything. <laughs> I'm going to talk with you tonight about the human will. You know you have one? Or do you? Do you know you have one? Okay, that's good. Since we've been talking about the coming of the Lord, the preparation of the bride, I'm going to give you some pointers now to help you. And go on in. You see, the trouble is with prophecy. It's uh, when you prophecy is tapping into the omniscience of God. That's what it is. It's a miracle, really, when you tap into that omniscience of God. And you learn some things about oncoming events. And they always cast their shadows on before. Always remember that. And man is always making this statement. I just can't understand spiritual things. <laughs> Funny. That's strange. But do you understand how God puts H2O together all and you drink it all the time, water? Do you understand how he does all of that? And out in the universe? Do you? You drink it, don't you? You've been drinking it ever since you were born, but you don't you don't have it. A baby has no understanding of what H2O is and the component parts and how they're blended together to keep from blowing you to smithereens. <laughs> it's the truth. If God had not so constituted even the atmosphere, one iota of a variation of the atmosphere, and you would be totally, you would totally disintegrate and fall apart. Independent, aren't we? <laughs> the wedding changes. Yes. One eye older. And every man and woman of us would fall dead, totally disintegrated. Right. How old? <laughs> so, what a foolish statement that you make. When you go into a restaurant, do you know all the components? of the food that they bring out to you. You know what's in all of it? If you did, you might not eat it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what's in some of those kitchens. <laughs> we went into a so-called nice one one time, and when they brought the food out, <laughs> one of the fellows that my daughter granddaughter was engaged to, he wanted to <laughs> eat his meat in a big, juicy cockroach jumped out. <laughs> Where did it begin? In the 
we're going to show you where it began in the will of this individual that God had created. The trial first. We're going to show you the components of the will and how their action, what causes you to do as you do. It is the sentinel at the gate. It is the guard. It is the will that uh, monitors whether or not God is going to be able to do with you what he wants to do. Did you know that? <laughs> it's your will that resists him. In the first Adam, when God made him before sin entered in, there was no resistance in him. But the reason today that you see all the problems you do with men getting to God is this. Their will stands guard over their soul and spirit and they will not let God come through. It's your will That is your greatest enemy. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> you have three parts. Emotions, will, and thought in the soul power. All right, what's the other one? What is the other one? What is it? Mind, intellect. Intellect is the other one. So you're made up of intellect, will, and emotion. Your emotions can be stirred, but your will is the determining factor whether or not you're going to let your emotions tender you to the point of surrender. Hallelujah. So here he is.
to face myself. That's the reason all men run. Not because they don't know it is real, but because they are not ready to face themselves. So I ran for a year. And every, and as bright and ghost as I was, and as rebellious, <laughs> every storm that came, I, though I didn't know anything about prayer, I cried out, Oh, God, don't let this storm hurt me. <laughs> if you let me through this storm, I'll go back to that church. <laughs> that was the Pentecostal church where my husband and his family had uh, gone, and I married into it, and they invited me. And when I got there, I'd never heard of one like that. And so when I got there, something hit me right down here. <laughs> A rock so big I couldn't get it up or down, so I said, I'm getting out. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> but you know what? I ran into a dead end street. Dead end. And God just let me hang myself. <laughs> oh dear, he has a way of doing that. <laughs> so some evangelists came to town. I'd run for a year. They'd go invite me on Sunday morning to go back with them and I'd I well I hated to cook. <laughs> hated to do all that stuff. But I'd say, oh no, you go on, I'll fix dinner. And I, I didn't really want to fix dinner, but I didn't want to go back there, so I fixed the big dinner for the family. <laughs> I, God said, go on, you're going the hard way, go ahead, I'll let you, till you get tired. <laughs> so I got enough of that, and so some evangelists came to China, and they were having a morning prayer meeting. And I, I, I didn't know what that was. Never heard of them. Never heard of the Baptist and Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. So they said, would you like to go to the morning prayer meeting? And I tell you, I had run so long, and I was so tired of fighting conviction. And so I said, well, I don't know. I'll think about it. And I really prayed that they would ask me. <laughs> but when they did, I didn't want them to know I wanted to go. <laughs> so I went back to the bedroom, turned around twice, <laughs> came back out. I said, uh, I think I'll go. I really didn't know what it held, so I went. <laughs> but I want to tell you a secret. <laughs> I got on the back row by myself. <laughs> Don't ever do it, mix in among the saints. <laughs> to the ministry as I can get. Yeah. I don't want any distractions in front of me. Yeah. If I can get there, I don't want anything in my way. I don't want anything or anybody in my way. Yeah. I've made up my mind. When I finally surrendered, I made it up then. And I said, God, whatever it takes. And they came to me that day. And I broke in a thousand pieces. <laughs> I said, Father, they said, receive the Holy Spirit. And I said, what are you talking about? But I, I said, whatever it is, give it to me. I've got to have it to give us the world and go through with God. <laughs> so in five minutes' time, I was the language, the heavenly language was pouring from me. Pouring, pouring, pouring out of me. It flowed like a river. 
Hallelujah. And it has never ceased. Hallelujah. <laughs> so you see, it's our will that we must contend with to surrender. For I want to tell you that when sin entered in, if sin had never entered in, God could have done with mankind exactly as he will. And he will for us to replenish the earth with the God kind of life. And had we not sinned, we would have procreated and never have had children that would have known sin. For you see, if man had a kept sin, an outside force, and the indwelling spirit, the working power within him, he would never have fallen. Hallelujah. So he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. It says, yes. <laughs> Thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that did make the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness? And any time we take God out of our lives, out of our schools, out of everything, we will have nothing left but a habitation of devils. That's all. That's what it will become. If you want to rule God out completely, then you'll have nothing left but a habitation of devils. That's all. There's only two things you can have. That's all. Just two. It's either God or the Satan. Sin or God. Faith or fear. Heaven or hell. That's all. The tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can take your choice. God gives you some choice. <laughs> have what you want. But you'll get everything that goes with it. You buy a sweeper, you get what goes with it. You buy it off when you try. You may not be able to afford all the attachments. <laughs> get a car, all oh, you people want everything that goes with it, don't you? We wish they did. We're automobiles. <laughs> they don't all want all that goes with them, I assure you. But nevertheless, I want you, if you will, to remember this, that when even they make a watch, do you know what they do with it? They test it first in ice water, the, the mechanism. Then they take it out of the ice water and put it into the fire. Even in the making of a watch that you carry around and tells time for you. So that it will hold up under any temperature. Hmm. <laughs> so then you think that God isn't going to enable us to go through some things that are going to test our metal? <coughs> Not at all. What does the will involve, anyway? Choice. Not only choice, but the minute you make a choice, it's not enough just to make a choice. You must then go ahead to execute it. To put it into operation. What you've made a choice to do, you must now put it into operation. So this is the two things that we have work in regard to the will. Choice, execution. 
Massachusetts on it. It is very intelligent, the will is, in its action. It has a great degree, a great quality of life if you will allow it to be sanctified and turned over to the Holy Spirit to bring it under divine control. It is one of your greatest assets. It will work for you beautifully if you will let it. Hallelujah. So in order to get you to see this in the scriptures, I want to take you to some of the, the uh, scriptures that will show you some of these things. Even the angels, you see, were put on probation. They had to make a decision whether or not they were going to obey God or disobey Him. Everything has been tested to see whether we would obey or disobey. And it is our will that makes the final decision, the supreme choice in life. So I'm going to take you, if you will now, please, to some scriptures that I want you to, to go with me in the Word of God. I'm going to show you some men who did this and what they became. If you will please go with me to Acts the 13th chapter. Twenty-two. Acts thirteen twenty-two. He's giving a rundown in this chapter on the history of the children of Israel. And so it says in the twenty-second verse, and when he had removed him, speaking of King Saul, who had been the king that God rejected, when he had removed him, and do you know what? He became a spiritual suicide. He took his own life. Had the greatest potential, the greatest promises offered unto him. Kingship. Great possibilities. But he made some choices that were wrong. For one thing, Saul never built an altar. He was never a man of prayer. Never. Samuel was the, the intercessor of the Old Testament in the days of Saul. And every time he ran into a snag, he ran to Samuel. And he said, Samuel, pray for me. Pray for me. And Samuel did it as long as he could. But there's just so far we can take you. So the day came when God said to that man Samuel, who was such a prayer warrior, Samuel, how long are you going to continue praying for this man when I rejected him? Imagine God having to tell a man to stop his intercession for him. That time comes. When God says, that's it. Don't ask me anymore. God is a God who is a conservationist. He does not waste your prayers on those who have rejected them time and time and time and time again. Opportunities have come and gone and come and gone and come and gone. And every time you are faced with a choice and you reject it, you get harder and harder and harder. Hallelujah. So God reproves them. <laughs> and you know, we who pray and love to pray for people, it's our problem that sometimes when we don't always see exactly the answer when we would like it, it's hard on us. So Samuel said, God, he said to him, Samuel, don't mourn over that man anymore.
No more Lori. I'm not wasting your energy. I'm not wasting your prayers. I'm not wasting your love. I'm not wasting it anymore. He's rejected it. He's through. Only God knows when that time comes in the life of an individual that it comes. We don't think so anymore. We're preaching everybody in the heaven. <laughs> oh yes, we're, you're going to think you're going to get there. You are if you will. Nobody can take you in in the final analysis but you and God. Your wife can't. Your husband can only take you so far. Your wife can carry you so far. But in the end, the final analysis, you have to make the decision on your own. How old? Yeah. So he said here, and when he had removed Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony. God gave a testimony concerning David. And this was God's testimony about him. This is what God said about him. <laughs> I love that. And said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. I can't imagine anything worse. <laughs> I've cried out to God all through the years. <laughs> he warned me one time in a dream. Because I'm such a definite-minded individual, when I'm for something, I'm for it. That if I ever turn back, I'd never come back. <laughs> He warned me, don't ever turn back, he said. <laughs> he warned Lot's wife, don't look back. <laughs> but she didn't heed it. And in looking back to a world that was under judgment, <laughs> and that's what we're doing tonight if we look back. We're looking back to a world that is under judgment. <laughs> so Jesus himself said, remember Lot's life. So I want to tell you, I haven't fooled with it. I haven't fooled with it. I haven't played with it. I've left it alone. For you see, the Bible speaks of the dog returning to its vomit. And the sow can turn to its wallowing in the mire. And then he speaks of the fact that if we do that, it's once we have gone back after having been washed in his blood. <laughs> and he said, and you go back, he said, the first time around, you didn't know any better. You only did what you did because of the nature you had, not the acts that you committed. It was a nature within you. <laughs> You'll never go to hell for your actions. You're going to hell because you have a nature that couldn't enjoy heaven if God took you there. <laughs> you don't have the capacity for it. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> So in his warning to me, warning me that I would never, I was never look back. I tell you, I have totally left it alone. For he said, it's those things that once I destroyed for you, you go back and build it in. You make yourself the transgressor. You're then become a sinner by not me. 
nature. Try to born again. I've been filled with the Spirit. I'd live for Him. But you see, if I would go back, take again, take up again that light, and tamper with it, fool with it. He said, if you go back to that, he said, then you will build again that which I once destroyed. Then you will make yourself a transgressor. And he said, the last hole on that individual is worse than the first. It will be doubly hard, he said then, harder for you to get back then than it was the first time you came to God. Not harder for God, but harder for you. Hallelujah. So that was God's testimony concerning a man after his own heart that he knew would all had this testimony <laughs> that he he hates sin just as much as he ever did you must separate the man from the sin he loves the man but he hates the sin and we want to be in the coming rapture or catching away which it is you see, before you can be caught away, God taught me one time that you must of necessity be caught up with him enraptured in spirit right here. <laughs> or you'll never be caught up then. He said it must first be a condition of life before it can become a state of being. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. This I like. Amen. I challenge us. I don't want that that isn't hard. And, it, and really this isn't hard anyway. You know who he said what kind of life is hard? The way of the transgressor was hard. <laughs> you have to go over Calvary, the outpouring of the Spirit, every bit of the love of God, you've got to trample it all under your feet. How long to go? That's why it's hard. God will make it hard for you as a transgressor. He loves you so much that he wants you back. All right, let's go on to First Chronicles, if you will, please, 12 to 33. against your enemy, 
and you see horses and chariots and a people more than you are, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be, when you come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people. Every squadron had a priest who went out to encourage the men who were going to war that God was for them. Go on to victory. Every one of them had a priest on their staff. A man who knew how to take his troops in the presence of God and get the victory for them before they went. So he said, and you will say unto them, Hear, O Israel, you approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts think. Fear not. And do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of the chariots and the horses. And you may, it may look like you're outnumbered, and the world makes us look that way. But he that's with us is far greater than he that's out there in the world. One with God. What does it say? Can do what? Can do what? But how many to fly? Yeah, 10,000. Or 2,000. Whatever it is, 1,000, I think it is. And how many? Two can put 10,000 to fly. Look at that. How powerful we are in your God. For he said, The Lord your God it is that goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officer shall speak unto the people. What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. You ought to know what all that means, but I don't have time to execute it tonight. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of his vineyard. What man is it that have betrothed a wife and have not taken her? Let him go, return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man take her. <laughs> and the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint heart? The Bible said, If we faint in the day of adversity, what? Our Strength is small. So he said, every man and no man that faints is going to be wrecked in the church. Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his. Do you know what an influence you have on others? There it is. If you're faint-hearted and you don't have any faith, and all oh, then you affect the other truth. So he says, let them go home. He said, I'd rather have a dozen that have faith in God and can go out and conquer the enemy than 10,000 that are faint-hearted. They have no faith. <laughs> Scared to death of the enemy. <laughs> so he said, uh, you'll speak to them, let them go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his. <laughs> and it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. When you come nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim, first of all, peace to the city, if they'll surrender. And it shall be, if it answers back to you and says, we surrender peace, we want peace. Then he says, open, and they open unto you, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they will serve thee. <laughs> but if it does not make peace with you, but will war against you, they hold out for war, then 
thou shalt be seated. You want to know the analogy? <laughs> when the Spirit of the living God comes to any man and says to him, do you want to surrender? Give your life over to me. Let me give you the peace that passes all understanding that can keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Or do you want to fight? God can take you on. But I want to tell you something. <laughs> You'll be all the worse for the battle that you win. For there is no peace, saith he, to those who want to take the way of the world. Right. You'll never have it. So I just wanted to show you that. Yeah. So let's go back to First Chronicles. That's the reason God doesn't want it in our midst. And he's going to weed out a lot of things in these last days. Yeah. He is. He's going to weed out a lot of things. For a lot of things are amongst us that are diminishing our power, our fire power. Hallelujah. So he's going to diminish the things. And this is what he's been speaking about and telling many, many people. That the church of the living God is going to be brought under the test. And just as the watch had to go through the fire and the ice water to tamper its metal and so they would hold up under any circumstances. So the church of the living God is going to be a proven Paranita people that have made their choice and will not turn back in the day of battle. Yeah. Hallelujah. We don't, we talk a lot about all the aspects of the Christian life except a good soldier for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Some of you, I don't know, that doesn't seem to hit us very well. <laughs> so, but I like a fat. I, I thank you that I passed through one this year. And I'm behind, it's behind me. But uh, nevertheless, <laughs> I've always been a person that I just love to when they spot a person to me <laughs> and they say if that person ever comes to God I'll believe so and so I, if you win him well I had a brother like that <laughs> he was an infidel in the first class division <laughs> and all my family and only have one brother said he's an intelligent individual and genius in his brain <laughs> and they always said if, and if you ever win Thomas if I ever see him come I'll know there's a God and that just challenged me I said God we're going to show you. Amen. Thomas is coming <laughs> you know what I did I'll give you some pointers <laughs> And we used to make altar calls. And we came down to the altar every time they made an altar call. But I didn't go for myself. I went there for my brother. And I said, I will go, God, until you bring me. I will see him come. He was a musician, played in an orchestra, traveled all over, and I lost him. I didn't even know where he was. <laughs> For four years, I hadn't heard of it. And so I said to God, as his birthday was drawing nigh, I said, now, Lord, you know where everybody in the universe is. You know where my brother is. I want to hear from him before his birthday comes around. One day, there came a knock at my door. And I went to the door, and a woman said to me, uh, I'm from the missing persons bureau. And I don't know why I've even come back here. I'm never supposed to do this. I said, what? 
I didn't, I'd never had any connection with the Missing Persons Bureau, so I wondered what she was talking about. And she handed me a letter, and she said, I've been to this place before, and I couldn't get anybody. And they tell us, because we have so many letters for missing persons, that if we do not get them the first time, never go back. But she said, I went to destroy this letter, and I couldn't. She said, I'll come back. And she was as curious as I was, so she stayed quick for me to open it. She was nosy, wasn't she? <laughs> but when I, I looked on the address and the name, and I didn't recognize anybody, I didn't know the name, the person. When I opened the letter, it was from a man telling me where I would find my brother. <laughs> I didn't know the man, never heard of him. So when I found out where he was, I went to the telephone and called him long distance. And he said to me, how in the world did you find me? And I told him who the man was. I gave him the name and all. I said, I think it's a friend of yours. He said, I never heard of him. <laughs> never. And to this day, my brother lives with me now. And to this day, neither one of us have ever heard of that individual. An angel of God sent me that letter. <laughs> Never. And bless him. Even though you know what he did with me when I got a hold of him? He hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to my knees and I said, now God, what's our next move? And at that time, we were pretty much in a lot of some of the hard times of the, out of the first depression. You probably don't know a lot about it, but we were in one. And so we didn't have a lot of money. And uh, I said, God, what do I do? And he said, go to Denver, Colorado, where your brother is. And I said, God, I don't have any money. About that time, my husband walked in. And he said, honey, guess what? He said, I just sold, or I mean, a piece of property, something, I don't remember. But anyway, we got $125, which was a lot in those days. <laughs> I've been a Christian 51 years. And so I said, oh, good. We're going to Denver, Colorado. <laughs> I said, to see my brother, the Lord said, go. <laughs> well, the Lord won out. <laughs> you think he does. <laughs> but he's the Lord won this time. So we got ready, got in the car, and headed for Denver, Colorado. And when we got to Denver, Colorado, drove up to the address, the man even told us where to find me. We drove up to the address and found him, and he came out. And he said, well, since... You want to go to get a drink? You want to do this? You want to do that? What do you want to do? He was wanting to wine us and dine us. And I said, I don't do that anymore. And he looked at me as if to say, what's happened to you? So he said, and I, so we, I said, come on in. I want to tell you, we went into the hotel room. We were sitting there talking. All of a sudden, with no warning, he got up and walked out on me. <laughs> My and looked at me, like a lot of men do with these women that they think are a little. <laughs> he said, now what? You brought me all the way to Denver, Colorado, and he walks out of here. I said, sit still, he'll be back. We waited, and in an hour's time, he walked back in that room just like he walked out and never said a word. <laughs> And I said, so I got to tell him my story about me finding Christ. But I want to tell you, this is the thing. Years later, after he came to God, he came to God, was filled with the Holy Spirit, even though he didn't believe there was a God. When I took him to a great meeting where a great woman evangelist by the name of Clara Grace's ministry, 
A woman gave a message in tongues, and my husband had warned me before we took it. Don't you dare say anything to him about the Holy Spirit in tongues. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll see. <laughs> I won't make any promises about that. I'm liable to do it. <laughs> so we took him to the meeting. <laughs> she, I mean, this woman spoke in a tongue, and Sister Grace gave the interpretation. And this is what she said. My son, I want you to know. And he didn't believe in the God that created the universe. She didn't know him. She didn't know he was in the audience. And so she said, my, he said, my son, I'm not only the God who created the universe, but I'm going to become your father and you shall become my son. And went on to tell about his life like they, God had read the book. <laughs> He turned to me and said, What was that? <laughs> and I said, That is what is known as the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. He said, My God, that's supernatural. I, he spoke to me and he got up and walked out of that seat and went to the altar. Was filled with the Spirit, saved, came up singing and sang with us and I looked at my husband and I said what now <laughs> oh, so you see if you faint in the day of battle your faith is small it's in the day of battle when everything Satan tries to make everything work in reverse and you have but faith does not look at the things that are seen He's our seal. We look at the unseen, invisible God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise his name. Well, I don't know how I got off on all that, but maybe now I've got my minutes. So I wouldn't have told you. I rarely tell a lot of these things about ourselves. But in Ezra, if you will go with me, please. I want you to take you there. I'm going to pass Chronicles for the moment, for that's just about Zebulun who were men who had understanding of the times and knew what to do and never broke rank in battle. And I told you about that the other night. Of course, many of you were not here. But what that meant when it spoke of men who did never, who never broke rank and were not of a double heart. Single-mindedness. Single-mindedness is what God wants. Not a double-minded man, not a double heart. On the day of Pentecost, they were all in one place with one accord, one mind, and that was this, to Adosiah, wait the coming of the Feast of Pentecost. And God had told them to stay there until that day came. And if they had a left, they probably, you would have been just like this today. Ten days it was they had to wait. Forty days Jesus came and went, and then when he left, he said, Go up in the upper room and stay until the day of Pentecost, till the Holy Spirit comes. They knew exactly when he would be coming. And if most of us had been there, the first or two days we'd have said, Well, I think we've been here long enough. Let's go. They'd have never been the recipients of it. Never. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount them up with wings as of eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So when he spoke of those men who knew how to keep right, I told him the other night at the uh, marriage supper of the land, that the reason, and the marriage supper of the land is in the same formation. The tables are set up the same formation. Then the truth of Israel 
So it had a certain formation. And even the strategists of battle today have gone into the Word of God to find out what was the secret of their victory. <coughs> and it was their formation, the formation of the truth. And they had one long flank and two right flanks. And in, that forms the cross. And as long as they kept that formation, they were saying to God, we believe in the cross of Calvary. And in that cross we glory. In that cross is our victory. And they won the battle every time. And the enemy was always seeking to get them to break rank. And the moment they broke rank, they were conquered. So that's what he's talking about here when he speaks of those men who never, they knew how to keep right. And they were not of a double heart. I'm pretty. <laughs> Nine o'clock. <laughs> I have so many things to tell you about this. <laughs> I'm going to quit. I wanted to take you to Ezra, James, John, Moses, Pilate, <laughs> Jesus, Daniel, Joseph, <laughs> to us. But uh, we're going to quit. You've had a long week, a lot of years. But the Bible says this. Where's our music? You there? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Did you say we had someone? She's fine. She's fine? Oh, right. oh she's coming the back way. Okay. All right. <laughs> you see, the Bible says this. Be ye steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. To be steadfast means this. You are fixed. No man can turn you to the right or to the left. You're going straight ahead. Jesus set his face like a flint. And the flint rock is one of the hardest stones known to man. But he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem to do the will of the Lord. And this is what he said in Psalms. I delight to do thy will, O God. <laughs> Hallelujah. For you see, he had come from those realms of life in him. He had seen how beautiful it was in its operation there. And he had come into the realm of the arena of wild beasts. One man of his kind come down into the arena of time. No one else like him. But the Father sent him. <laughs> we didn't want him. <laughs> so into this arena of time, and it is likened unto wild beasts who would have loved to have torn him apart. But they couldn't. You can't destroy a man who has no sin in him. You can't. <laughs> so I want to tell you just one last thing tonight. <laughs> and this, to me, is so beautiful. And it so touched my heart. Because this last year, I, I, I guess I dug in that word so much. <laughs> For I set such long hours. 
in such pain. And I'm never been a person that ever wanted to give up. I never wanted anybody to do for me what I could do for myself. But I had to go in a wheelchair. I could have been left crippled. Patrol my bedroom. <laughs> the next day I felt so much better and 
I thought it was all over. <laughs> I went to church. And as we were going to church, I looked out the window of my car, and going along with this car was that white horse and that white <laughs>
I want somebody else to have as well as me. If it's God, there's going to be somebody else that God's going to say the same thing through. Show them the same thing. Don't ever think that if you just get it yourself, that's God. That's not it. There's going to be somebody else that's going to have this, and as a rule, there'll be three witnesses. So I held it for several months. I didn't say one word, never said a word to anybody. One day, a friend of mine, whose husband used to be with Senator Stemmons in the South, and is now with the 700 Club, a very fine man. They were good friends of ours, and she loved to pray with me. And uh, we just enjoyed each other, and so she called me one day and said, Could I come over and pray today? And I said, Come on. So she came, and we were praying. All of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord came on her, and she began to prophesy about the very thing God had told me about Brother Hagen, the disappearance, and the audience, and all about it. And, and the Spirit had said to me, Brother Hagen, and there will be others. And she pointed a finger at me, and she said, and you will be one of them. I said, oh, God, me? Because I hadn't thought about anything like that. And so that was two witnesses. I still didn't say anything. But later on, somebody told me that Charles and Francis Hunter here in Texas have said the same thing and have even told it in their readings. And so a year ago, when I went out to Brother Hagen's, God said to me that anything that's of God must of necessity be told before it happens. For everybody loves to jump on the bandwagon and say, Oh, after it happened, oh, I knew that. Why didn't you say it if you did? Faith speaks beforehand. So God said to me that night when I was out there and Brother Higgin had called me to the platform and had ministered to him and now God said, now's the time you're going to tell us. I said, oh God, no. He said, yes, you're going to tell us. So I turned to Brother Higgin and I told him, I said, Brother Higgin, God has spoken this to me and not to me only. But I told him he knew the Rankins, they'd gone to... Uh, Bible school at Rama had graduated from there. He'd come out of his uh, political offices and had gone to Rama. And uh, Brother Higgin knew him, knew that they were reliable, reputable people. And I said, This has come from me, it has come from Rosalind, and it has come from the hundreds. And I told him about it. I told the audience. Well, the students, of course, literally won out of their seats. <laughs> and I hadn't been to Rama because of not being well the last year. And I went. They invited me to come and speak just recently. And the first 20 minutes of the time that I was there, God spoke again of this glory that was going to be revealed within the next few months. And they were going to see it. So you see, to those who believe, we're going to see things transpire that we've never seen. And God said this, the light, when this takes place, of the glory of God will be like it was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. When the glory of that light which had been hid and veiled off in human flesh, and that day on the Mount of Transfiguration, that glory that he had with the Father before the worlds began shine out up there. And he said it will shine out of men and women of God with such brightness of my glory that men sitting in the audience will literally be blinded like 
like Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus for a season. When they regain their sight again, they will be believers personified, he said. They were at 
his command, but because he refused, but he said to me, though I refuse to do it because of the will of the Father, I had to fulfill. Now you can call them, and they will be here. Aren't you thrilled? God has such potential. Oh, such unlimited opportunities. You talk about the God of opportunities. The God of a fair bargain and equal employment. It's there in the life of God. How
David of old, like Joseph, when he said no to Pharaoh's wife, Potiphar's wife, rather. I will not do this thing and sin against my God.